Hello lovelies, I thought I already reviewed Forbidden Lands, but apparently I hadn't. I also just finished recording a long, rambling, normal style review for Forbidden Lands, which then failed to render because my computer ran out of drive space and could no longer recognise the file. I don't really feel like going through in the same rambling detail as I did before, because I, you'll probably find it boring. Anyway, uh, but yeah, okay. I should also remind you that Penny Tower, which I wrote for Wretched New Flesh, is out in digital format and probably Lulu soon over on the Red Room, so go and check that out and buy it. Forbidden Lands, meanwhile, is by Free League or Freya Logan, as they're otherwise known. It's a nice box set, about the right size to go on a shelf, for the box at least. Um, it's a kind of wildernesses and waypoints type game. It's a somewhat post-apocalyptic fantasy. You get a player's handbook, a games master's guide, uh, Legends and Adventurers, which is full of random table goodness, which I'm sure a lot of people will find very helpful, especially tailored towards uh, character creation. You also get a bunch of these stickers, which I'm struggling to get out, which are meant to go on this map of the area, which won't fit on the screen, but yeah, it's quite quite nice, quite hard wearing. Uh, no dice, no cards, um, but both of those things are both mentioned and sold separately. So for a box set, that felt like a bit of a jip, to be honest, um, not getting those things with it. Uh, but they're not essential, I suppose. Um, and you know how I'm not a fan of novelty dice and so on. So uh, yeah, but still. The other thing with box sets is, of course, that they cost more here in the UK because boxed games have VAT added to them while books do not. So while these are nice and the box is nice and the map's nice and the stickers are nice, it, it doesn't have everything that you would typically want in a box set to just pick up and play to the fullest extent. Um, and while two books are nice, one larger format super thick book would also work and would avoid VAT here in the UK. So yeah, you get a player's book and a Games Master's Guide. Now, because I already did this review, um, I will be somewhat quicker and more slapdash than I typically would be. <laughs> um, faux leather cover, nice gold inlay, ribbon, of course, we like ribbons. It's cream paper, uh, a slightly grey ink is used throughout, so it's not completely stark black. The artwork is sketchbook-like, uh, which is nice. Uh, it does have a set background, but it is very open for customization. There are lots of random tables and so on for inspiration. And because the characters aren't overly powerful, um, and because the characters are in such a state that weaker, weaker monsters can still be a bit of a threat, it's relatively easy prep. You can just roll a few times on a few of the tables, grab a few monsters, Robert's your mother's brother. Away you go. Uh, so characters are defined by their kin, which is race by any other name, uh, their profession and their age. If you play an older character, you have less stat points, but more skill points and more talents. Talents are kind of like feats or special capabilities and so on. Um, so if you want to play like a starting effective magic user, you are encouraged by the rules uh, and the tropes, I guess, to, to play an older wizard type, and then you'll be more effective at that as you as you go into the game. So it, it balances out mostly, and once experience gets going, uh, these early choices are going to mean a lot less. Characters will even out rather rapidly. You have your typical fantasy races. Human, elf, half-elf, dwarf, half-lang, meh. Then you get into some slightly different ones. 
So you have Wolfkin, who are sort of beast men, who are kind of set up to be baddies, even more so than, than goblinoids. Um, but if you have a particular furry fetish, it doesn't appear that there is anything to stop you playing one of these. Uh, you can also play Orcs and Goblins, which is a little bit uh, fresh and different, I guess. Well, it's not, actually, is it? Because treating Orcs and Goblins and other monstrous humanoid races as the same as any other race, that, that's become quite stale and boring. But what I found interesting here was that the Orcs were created in the standard setting as a warrior race by the elves to do the fighting for them. So the elves are kind of aloof, um, above the fray sort of, sort of thing, but then they created this warrior race that later turned on them. And the goblins see their role as protecting settlements and so on during the night, you know, creeping around in the darkness, um, that sort of thing. So uh, I find that a bit played out to be honest, but there's enough of a different spin on it that it's not too bad. In terms of professions, you've got Druid, Fighter, Hunter, Ranger by any other name, uh, Minstrel, an actual bard rather than a magical D&D bard, Peddler, which was a bit different, um, but kind of makes sense in the setting, because there's a kind of post-apocalyptic setting is the default. Travelling from place to place, trading you know, rare goods to settlements that are only just remaking contact makes makes plenty of sense rider cavalry is a perfectly good name <laughs> you could have used that a bit more evocative rogues everyone knows what rogues are sorcerers yeah that's got your basics covered pretty much uh, as i said your age has varying effects on your on your stats and skills one little uh, twist is that you have a pride. This is a loosey-goosey woolly concept, as is your dark secret, because uh, everyone has a dark secret. Your pride is something that you pride yourself on. So it could be a particular skill, it could be a particular capability, it could be an incident from your family's past history or whatever. And then once per game you can invoke that pride, and that gives you an extra 12-sided dice to roll. And normally you'd be rolling d6s. So, yeah, that that's nice. Your Dark Secret, if you bring it into play, you get some extra experience points. So that encourages the players to uh, actually play out their Dark Secret because they get rewarded for it. Something I've always liked since something similar in Deadlands where, <coughs> excuse me, if you play out your, your flaws, you get tokens that you can then spend to modify rolls. So, I yeah, I like that. Your dice pool is built from your stat, plus skill, plus any bonuses. Certain equipment and so on might give you bonus dice. You know, so, so it goes. <coughs> equipment also wears down and breaks in this, so uh, weapon smithing and repair skills are you know, a useful, important thing to have in this. If you're familiar with the Year Zero engine, you will know that I have issues with it. Um, in that it's too difficult to do stuff. Now, they do say you shouldn't be rolling all the time for everything, and that the things you're rolling for should be you know, high-stress situations and so on. Uh, but they do, at the same time, have average difficulty zero modifier so you're doing something average it seems you're still expected to roll uh, the typical character will have three to four in a stat and two to three uh, in a professional skill so you're looking at about six dice so you would think if you're not particularly math literate that having six dice six six-sided dice would pretty much guarantee you getting a six, right? This is going to be a bad example, but... Okay, there we go. No, 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 it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, on six six-sided dice, you're only going to get a six on one of them about two-thirds of, the uh, two of the time, which means you're going to fail about a third of the time, unless you push your roll, in which case you get to re-roll anything that wasn't a one or a six. Right, and then try to try to get a success or more successes 
but you also run the risk of straining yourself and taking statistic damage or breaking your equipment or having other mishaps happen. And you shouldn't need to push yourself to do an average task most of the time, right? I mean, if a surgeon doing routine surgeries screwed up 33% of the time or a mechanic doing typical normal stuff to the engine of your car screwed up 33% of the time, you would not see that surgeon. They would not keep their job. You would not go to that mechanic, <laughs> right? So uh, I find their odds, percentages, chances of doing things to be um, too difficult most of the time. Now, that is mitigated somewhat by the fact that this is a survival-oriented game. Things are meant to be hard. It's meant to be about difficult choices, wear and tear. These are all, these are all thematic. And it will probably work okay in The Walking Dead. I didn't feel that it necessarily worked particularly well in Twilight 2000 using the same engine and with the survival thing. So I'm hoping they will have revised that a bit and done some things differently with the with the Walking Dead game, but um, we'll see. Uh, there are ways around it. I mean, like they say, you can say don't roll, but you've got to review a game as written. So what if they're crap and still want to do something, even if it's a non-stressful situation? What are the odds of them doing it? You know, you, sometimes you need a guide. One way around it, I I think, would be to say, okay, at any time you can trade six dice for one success if it's a non-stressful situation. So that means that your average mechanic, your average surgeon, could just trade the dice each time, and then it's only under duress, under stress, that you would roll and have and have the risk there. I mean, there should always be a slight risk. Uh, maybe have them still roll, but maybe if it's all ones or something, <laughs> I, d I don't know. But for most purposes, I think trading in dice for successes um, would give the, the kind of effect that, you w that we'd want. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the permutations of skills. It's all pretty much how you'd expect. Talents are always exceptions to rules, special capabilities. It can be a headache for the games master can be a headache for the player. These are all fairly simple um, in their implications and exceptions and so on. And I do think that they are very necessary in order to differentiate the characters from each other. Otherwise, one fighter build is going to be pretty close to another fighter build and so on, um, unless you're going out of your way to play against type I guess would be the way to put it but yeah so you have special talents associated with your kin, your race, special talents associated with your profession and special talents that are available to anybody called general talents combat and damage, yeah it's more implications if you know year zero then pretty much you know it um some tips and so on for playing the bad guys and their tactics using random elements like cards and so on but again there's no cards in the box it's a bit incomplete as far as a boxed set goes uh, magic is always a pain in the butt but if you enjoy magic going all awry then there's a magical mishap table um, and a, a lot of this should appeal to old school gamers while at the same time appealing to some newer school gamers because it's not derived from D and D, and it is far more focused, um, as said, upon the wilderness and digging up history and, and learning about the background. So it's a good game to start without knowing anything about the game background. Um, and also, there's a really intense focus on the game in setting up a camp or a fort or a settlement and developing that, uh, building it up, 
keeping it financed and repaired and all the rest of it well, that's and, and there's a survival element as well so yeah like wildernesses and waypoints is is what maybe it it should be called um the stronghold rules are a much more complete version of the kind of ideas that we saw back in original D&D back in the day and they should be quite familiar to anyone who has placed uh, who has played Vason because it works in a very similar way to the way in which you build up your base of operations in that or you could even harken back to Conspiracy X it looks pretty easy to expand upon and add new elements and interpret for new things so customization is is pretty uh, clear and easy for the most part the games master's guide delves into the specific law but the game is wide open for you to create your own law your own locations everything else the bestiary is fairly limited but human or humanoid enemies should probably be quite common uh, and for that you don't really need a bestiary uh, there are plenty of magical artifacts plenty of encounters ways to generate adventure encounters villages castles fortresses things like that and some example locations which go with the map in the book but even so there's quite a lot of the uh, random generation elements he says trying to find them um, in that separate booklet that I showed you earlier but also tra a proper ge treasure generator um, a lot of it using d66s um, some typical NPCs so you can quickly generate those on the fly uh, castle generator dungeon generator there's plenty here that is useful for solo players and for GMs who are strapped for time um, you can definitely do this as a low prep game even though you've got all this background and lore and history to delve into if you just need an adventure on the fly it's it's pretty easy one thing I did like very much was that the monsters often have these tables of different things that they might do um, so that helps cre keep creatures fairly unpredictable so this Ent attacks with its gnarly roots one adventure within range is ensnared by thick roots roll for the attack with nine base dice and weapon damage one blunt force if the attack succeeds the victim is grappled the roots have strength three right and you have similar tables for most of the monsters and little quirks and individualities about them which helps compensate somewhat for otherwise the monsters being fairly standard uh, so what do we think then in terms of style it's well presented simple I like the sketchbook style I like the quality of the books um, I like this a lot more than any of the recent D&D output um, in terms of artwork as well you know black and white clean lines sometimes that's that's nice and sometimes a change is as good as a rest um, the box set is a little bit lacking by not having the the dice and so on but in terms of style i can't really fault it too far um except the idea of stickers on a map i think is going to horrify most gamers who like to keep things fairly uh fairly nicely conditioned um and and not destroyed by having stickers stuck all over them but uh maybe that's just me being uh well, let's put it this way. Retention is an excellent quality in an anus. Um, four out of five for style. In terms of substance, yeah, it's substantial but adaptable. It is. It has the background and the lore and so on, but you can easily tailor this to pretty much anything else. Uh, if you want something a bit more gritty, um, realism adjacent um, you could definitely play this and retain a gritty old school feel despite having nothing to do with old school typical rules for quite some time um, yeah you could definitely sustain this as a, as a game of that sort but it is very much focused on the, the wilderness 
and upon building up your your fort rebuilding civilization colonizing you might say um but there are things that i think are are missing from the box set you know when you buy a box it's nice to get everything in the box that they expect you to have so yeah low four out of five for for substance still that's eight out of ten so that's a fairly strong recommend from me for forbidden lands go get it but get penny tower first zang Ars Goetia presents classical demonology for OSR games. If you like your magic to have a little authenticity, if not reality, then Ars Goetia will give you all the tools necessary to bring classical ritual magicians and demonologists into your OSR games. Subconscious. You say it. You even think it. Yeah, I had it.